The only reason I'm doing this out there, I want to tell all these people why I'm doing this. It's because my parents had a bad time in this world, and I've had a bad time in this world. I can't get a job, and I can't do nothing. People have been getting on my case. I have no money. I've gone hungry. My dad's been sick. My old man almost died. I, I was crazy to do this. I regret doing it, in a sense, but I'm glad that I did it because I got what I wanted. I wanted to talk to somebody and tell these people about how this establishment uh, get stuff out of you, you know, like uh, lots of taxes, you don't get what you want. You know, people over there in White Rock area going hungry, people out in Del Paso Heights going hungry, no jobs, uh, laws too strict, uh, you know, the whole story, you people understand that stuff. You know, I just wanted to make sure this was told from my side of it, that's why I'm doing this. Run wrong. Uh, Well, I figure if I'm going to get caught, I'm going to blow my brains out. So uh, I can say that to you people. And uh, I wouldn't be doing this, you know, except I just need the money. I can't stand living like I am. I mean, see, look at my shoes, man. My shoes got big rips in them. You know, my mom can't afford to buy them. In fact, they hardly ever give me any money. You know, I just, you know, get what I can get. There was not enough food. Um, I couldn't find a job. I had no transportation. And... I don't, want to, I don't want to sound like a sob story or anything, but uh, I just want to get this money and I just want to leave. That's all I want to do. Tell your story. Now that we tell your story, what, what are you going to do then? Are you going to carry on this thing down to... Okay, I want to make it perfectly clear. If anybody gets hurt in there, it's not, it's not me hurting them. It's the people outside. If them people try anything hasty out there, you know, it's going to mean somebody's neck. And it ain't going to be my neck. I just want to make that perfectly clear. If anybody gets hurt, it's going to be caused by the policeman out there, not me. That's all I got to say. Brian might have something to say. Brian? Something else to say, Brian? You got something to say? No. All right. He we doesn't speak. Shoot some, of the, uh, shoot some film of the people. That's Mr. Roof. It's all right. Bill, I it's up to you. You prefer we wouldn't? Okay. Whatever you say. Their parents are here? Yeah, their mothers. Where are they? Yeah, they were from the farm. Where? Somewhere over there. Where? By Bailey. They just shot you in the rear. I think you're car. Unfortunately, our film is lost.
put chalk in that gun, man. Don't know. out of that growth. There he goes there. But you don't want the public to try to. Hell no. Why are you nervous now? I don't know. Well, first I, I, I'd like to. Times. With the gas and everything, you know. One thing about your plan has always had me puzzled. You were very solicitous about all the hostages you had, except the one woman you had in the vault, to whom you taped a, a shotgun to her neck. Why in the world did you do that? Her, her testimony against you was just devastating. Yes. Um, well, I want to say right now that uh, I feel very badly about that. And it's, it was, it used to bother me terribly. But, um, it was our security. It was um, going to stop, and it did stop, I feel, the police, the law enforcement, from breaking in, to going in and trying to, well, and I was just eliminating that possibility by doing that, and saying this, the shotgun taped to her neck, and uh, you know, I didn't want them coming in or, any, or trying anything stupid, you know, because I don't want anybody hurt. You know, the gun was not loaded, 
you know. And there wasn't a gun, it wasn't a shell on a chamber. So uh, there was no possibility of her getting her hurt. But it was still, she was still scared and everything, and uh, it's a terrible. How did you come to do what you did, other than the fact that... How did we do that? Well, do you want me to answer that yes. now? Mm -hmm. uh, well, for months, we were just, <coughs> you know, bumming around, no job. And um, we were smoking pot and, you know, and just taking walks at night and stuff. And uh, having nothing to do. I mean, just complete boredom. And, uh, well, there's one thing I don't want to mention is, you know, our, I, I have been stealing bikes before, you know. And, uh, but that wasn't enough money, and we just, we were thinking about doing a crime that was going to set us up for good. We wouldn't have to worry about anything, and uh, wouldn't have to, you know, uh, worry about when the next meal is going to come, and uh, where we're going to live, you know, and uh, the mortgage and all that. You know, you have to worry about that. How did you devise the, the plan of holding people for hostage in a bank? Well, we, we figured that if, you, if we went into the bank, and the bank is built not to be broken into. So if we took control of the bank, and that way they couldn't come in. You know, it was built not to be broken into. And so by having the hostages in there and asking for the money, we figured we could just leave with the money, with the couple hostages, go to Mayfair Air Force Base, and then take off. And we Do were- what? And we were going to take off, and we'll, it was, we were going to just grab a plane, you know. It was, I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to uh, be honest with you, and it's uh, quite obvious that this wasn't planned, you know, very well, eh? to say the least. One thing you did has me puzzled. You were very solicitous of all the hostages you took, except the one you took into the vault and taped the gun, yeah. shotgun to her neck. How did you come to do that? I feel I was set an, ex uh, an example. I was sentenced as an example. Uh, if judge, I feel the judge had in mind was uh, punishment more than uh, helping uh, these two young kids, you know. Uh, he sentenced me, I feel, with pressure from the banks. And because it surely wasn't public pressure. I had, you know, I could tell by the letters that I received that the public was on my side and sympathized with, uh, with me and my problem. I was in a situation. So you were sentenced to prison. You spent about 11 months uh, in Vacaville and in Tracy. It's like going into a bad whorehouse, you know, and, you know, like when there's all kinds of monsters. You never know when something's going to jump out on you. And you, and you, it's like, when prison, it's like you walk, wherever you go, you feel like this, like this monkey sitting on your back. You know, it feels like worms crawling over you. Because you know people in there are always looking, always afraid of everybody else. You know, they're saying, oh, it might be my turn to die or something. Or, or I might, you know, or somebody, something might happen to me that would cause me to have to hurt somebody else. You know, it's a, it's a jungle. That's what it is. And people in there are more afraid, they're afraid of each other. And I was hearing this pounding like there was a fight in the room. Just pounding and uh, fighting and stuff. And uh, all of a sudden I hear Woody, the guy come down, three, he was two doors down from me. He come out screaming, yelling, get out of my room, get out of my room. And there was blood all working down from him. He must have had 
I don't, you know, it was holes in here, and the flesh was torn, and they had got his juggler vein. And he had got, grabbed a hold of the railing, I and mean, my house is right there. You know, I could see him, was, he was only about four or five feet away from me. And then he went down the stairs, like I said, the stairs is right in front of my room. And he went down the stairs for a half run and half walk, and then he tripped and fell. And he was just sitting there laying, in a, and the blood was just coming out, and I mean, it was this big puddle. And they finally had calmed down, and they had um, put him on the gurney thing and took him out. And boy, you could, you could just imagine what things were going through my mind. The first morning I'm there, you know, one of the dudes that I ate chow with earlier, you know, and he died later on. They talk a lot about the homosexuality problem in prisons. Either of you, uh, either of you have any experiences that way? Yeah, yeah. When I first hit Tracy, um, I went there uh, about a couple weeks. You know, I was still new there, and guys, the other guys there were still checking me out, see what. From talking with your parents earlier, that prison was a rough experience for you. I wonder if you know. I mean, because unless you're actually there and you can go through it and worry about if you're going to be alive the next day. To eat. Well, you knew you had to be punished. What 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 do you think that? You know, you put it. I was asleep and I missed it, and because uh, I liked being outside. Anyway, I was got permission from the guard to shower. And while I was in there, we're taking a shower, and then these uh, Chicano dudes come up. And there's three of them, and they come up in the shower, and uh, jumped in the shower. You know, it's a stall. You know, with about ten showers in there, and uh, I'm the only white dude in there. You know, and it's pretty racial in there. Racial in there, and. Uh, the dude next to me looks over at me and he says, uh, I want to take your booty, which uh, I want to take you, you know. And uh, I just looked at him, you know, I had a feeling this dude was going to jam me, you know, he's going to approach me on this. Well, I just looked at him, I didn't say nothing, you know. I finished washing up and the other dudes were laughing, you know. So I get out, and I dried myself off, put on my drawers and put on my pants, and I said, hey. And he looks over at me, and looks at his buddies and they laugh. He says, uh, I mean, I said, uh, if you want to take my booty, head on, you know. And he just looked at him, you know, he looked at me, looked at his partners, and they laughed again, you know. And he just went like this, you know, which means, you know, forget it. If, they're, if, you do, if you're weak, they're going to get you. I mean, they're going to, you know, approach you. And I've seen it happen myself. I've seen it happen. Guys come in, in fact, one guy that came in with me from Vacaville, the processing center, I'm moving Tracy with me, and uh, he's just a little guy. He's only 17 years old in, the, in a penal institution. And the poor guy, I couldn't help him because I, mean, I would have stuck up with him. I'm young myself. I would have fought with him if he, if he would have came to me and said, hey, I want you to help me. And he did do that, but he wouldn't stick up for himself. And I can't stick up for somebody that's not going to stick up for himself. If, if, he's, if he doesn't think he's good enough for sticking up for, if he doesn't think that much of his manhood, well, he's no good. I mean, you know, I'm just going to let him do it. So uh, he, wouldn't, he just wanted me to fight for him. And that's wrong there. If you, if you just do your program, if the guys see you, if they, if they see you doing, trying to do your best, Really, they will leave you, you know, they won't hassle you because they'll say, hey, this guy's really trying. In there, they're going to say, hey, this guy's really trying. Don't mess with him. Okay, the main idea behind that is to bring Well, I interviewed him at the uh, Dual Vocational Institute at Tracy, and uh, my first impression of uh, Mike was he was uh, very pale, had shaven his head off. He looked like he was weak, uh, underfed, and uh, Brian was the same way. He looked very uh, insecure at the time, uh, scared, to be honest with you.
well, I want to become a writer. And uh, that might sound a little funny because I was illiterate before, but now that I have gotten the chance and now uh, my uh, uh, reading and writing is uh, you know, great and you know, much better, and uh, I want to become a journalist. Looking at it then, uh, now, and in my future, uh, what I did has helped me. It's helped me a great deal because otherwise I'd be out there uh, doing some dead end job for a dollar sixty five and probably living at home with my mom and uh, not being able to support myself and just going through these dead end jobs all through my whole life. Now I have the opportunity to uh, I'm going to school, studying journalism, and uh, uh, I'm, I have a profession. I'm, I'm working towards this profession that's going to, you know, something that I would like to do, something that I want to do and, and be fulfilled in doing it and satisfied in doing it. Fighting him. You're fighting what he represents, and that his, that's his clique. And so you're going to have to have somebody back in your Okay, both uh, Brian and Mike have been here since September of last year, and uh, I've had numerous contacts with them, and uh, all reports that I have received are very positive. Uh, Mike is working a receiving unit. Brian is uh, going to school and doing very well. I've drawn closer to my mom, you know. I, on the streets, I was, you know, in and out of the house. I mean, I was in, and, where are you going? You know, my mom said, where are you going? So, well, I'm going out, I'm going out with my partner, you know, and out the door I was, you know. I didn't really know my mom, you know, besides the point that she told me not to do this and do this, you know. Sure. I really didn't, but it, being in here has got me, gave me a chance to know my mom as a person, not just as my mom, but as a person, because, uh, uh, we sat plenty of times in the visiting area and, and just talked, uh, small talk, but got to know each other and got to be close, really close with each other in here. And uh, uh, I don't know. I don't really know think there's been, a, there's been a, a strengthening, a strengthening oh, yes. of the family? Yes, yes, yes. Strength within the whole family, you know. You get to understand her problems more and she gets to understand your problems more. You know, you, you can, uh, you grasp what's wrong. You know, you grasp the idea that, say, like, uh, she's uh, got bills to pay and stuff like this, you know, and you didn't realize that before, and, you know, like, why she was always naggy some mornings and why she wasn't. Yeah, I guess you get the feeling that parents really care about you, and before maybe you're worried yeah. about that. Yeah, right? you know, it's, it's, it's something really weird to sit down and actually talk with your mom and actually listen to what she says. And uh, I'm doing college work, college work now. And uh... yeah, it is not much. Most of these comments and most of the series of questions we do, the comments can go uh, a guy that has quit school and that is just. Um, Maybe at home and uh, in the drug scene and, and just bumming around, partying all the time. Uh, my advice to them is to, to find out what they want in life. Just stop and analyze themselves and say, hey, what do I want? Do I want to do this all my life or what? I say, and, uh, and just do that. And uh, once they find out, 
chiefly what they want, they ha they're going to have to have uh, schooling, education. I have to stress, um, uh, stress schooling before I went into the bank. Uh, I want to, I don't know how many times I said this before, but I was illiterate and uh, I, it was hard finding a job. It was frustrating. I mean, the first thing you do when you go get it, to go apply for a job is to apply for it. And if you can't read, you can't apply for it, you know. So I was frustrated that I couldn't find a job. It was, it was like being closed in without, there's, there wasn't a door to get out, you know. You can't get anywhere without an education. I mean, you, it's taken you. Know, you it's you, been a hard lesson for you to learn, hasn't oh, it? Oh, very hard. And uh, time, you know, it's time. It's a, it's a bummer.